Hello, may I now request our Vice Chancellor sir to introduce our lecture series and to welcome our distinguished speaker. Sir, please. Phone call. Sir, may I now request you to welcome our speaker and to introduce our lecture series? Well, sir, so I think now it's my pleasant task of introducing Professor Payne. Professor Payne is a pioneer in social work and he is an emeritus professor of Metropolitan University London and now is associated with Kingston University in South London. And Professor Payne, it's a great, great privilege. Uh, for us to welcome you on, in this particular series, which is quite prestigious. 
And uh, after I joined in 2018, I started this lecture series and we get people from all over the world and those who are really you know, well-known in their field. So in that case, we are really privileged that you accepted our invitation. And I must also thank our colleague, Professor Shubhasri Sanyal. You know, she's the one who contacted you and she's the one who introduced me to you uh, through you know, letters. Um, I think, you know, pandemic is very bad because it's harmful. It causes all kinds of, you know, So I think uh, audio trouble from uh, that side. Am I audible to other speaker? Please response. Other, no, uh, other... No, am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No. Welcome, sir. Sorry, Professor Payne. I kept you waiting, but you know because of technical glitches, you know I suddenly got disconnected uh, from you. But as I said, you know it's a great uh, privilege to have you, and mm -hmm. I was you know, appreciating the pandemic in the sense that pandemic helps us to you know bring people from all over the world to a very closure through this virtual mode, but uh, at the same time, we're a little unhappy okay. because mm -hmm. pandemic is also very harmful. The mute. Now, I think, you know, uh, uh, it's no point wasting time. Professor Payne, uh, you can start. But before that, I would like to request uh, Dr. Subhasti Sanyal to introduce Professor Payne to the, you know, those who are participating in the lecture. And then, Professor Payne, you will start the lecture. Dr. Sanyal, over to you. Thank you so much, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Vishu Bharati lecture series. This is the 29th lecture series that we are holding. I welcome respected Professor Malcolm Payne and other faculty members, staff, invitees to this lecture series. Uh, the Vishu Bharati lecture series is being held uh, just after the occasion of the World Social Work Day, which was on the 16th of March. And the theme was uh, Ubuntu, I am because we are, and around the idea of strengthening solidarity and global connectedness. Hence, we have our lecture based on the theme of social work, human relationships, and COVID-19. Uh, introducing our Professor Malcolm Payne. Uh, professor Payne is an Emeritus Professor at the Manchester Metropolitan University, Honorary Professor at Kingston University, London St. George's Medical School, University of London, and a docent in social work, Helsinki University, Finland. He was formerly Director of Psychosocial and Spiritual Care, St. Christopher's Hospice, London, and has worked in local community development in Liverpool, policy and mental health series development across the UK, as well as many different forms of social work practice. His recent books include How to Use Social Work Theory in Practice, an Essential Guide by Policy Press, uh, Modern Social Work Theory by Red Globe and our Older Citizens and End of Life Care Social Work Practice Strategies for Adults in Later Life by Rutledge. He co-wrote Social Work and End of Life and Palliative Care with Margaret Reed, Policy, Policy Press, and Internationalizing Social Work Education Insights from Leading Figures Across the Globe, 
uh, again from the policy press. He co-edited the Routledge Handbook of Social Work Theory, 2019, with Emma Raythal. Professor Payne is the father, is one of the fathers of social work theories, and uh, as um, uh, faculties in the Department of Social Work, I, I feel greatly honored to have Professor Payne, whom we have read and whom we have learned all our uh, knowledge from, to have with us at, at our own university to share his knowledge with us. So, sir, you're welcome, and uh, you can kindly start with your lecture. Thank you so much. Well, I think I've un unmuted, so that, that looks as though it's okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to visit another country, even if just online, um, and talk about social work and hear about your views of social work. And that's what I aim to do here. I am going to talk a little bit about uh, some of my uh, views of social work and how it's responding to the COVID-19 situation. Um, but before I start out on that, uh, I just want to say what a privilege it is to uh, visit uh, again, if only online, the university associated with Tagore. Uh, some of his poetry has been on my bookshelves for decades. And uh, it's, uh, it's really an exciting excitement to me to make a connection with you. Um, what I'm going to do now is to share my screen. So you may want to adjust the, um, uh, the view that you have of uh, the participants um, uh, to uh, enable you to see the slides. At the moment, the program has disabled my screen sharing. So it needs to, the host needs to enable my screen sharing. Nimai? Nimai? Yes, I'm asking, I am asking him to enable you. Nimai, you can enable Kurtave. Shubhasri? What I enable Kurtave? Screenshot enable for the host key. Where is the mind? I am here, sir. Sir, we are doing. We it, are sir. doing, sir. Do, do it, do it, please. Yeah, 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 please. Sir. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, is it fine now? Still saying it's disabled. I can see your screen. I think settings are. Sir, so just a minute, just a minute, sir. We are doing it. Just a minute, sir. Sir, could you try now? Yeah. Rod. What did you say? I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. Sir, okay. I've enabled it. Uh, sir, you can do it right now. That's great. I'm just going to bring up the. And you should now see a blank screen with my uh, name on it. Yes, sir. Yes. It is clearly. You want, may want to adjust your own screen. So, looking at this title, which uh, I agreed with your colleagues, I've um, put together some discussion about um, an agenda which I think inter creates an intersection between three. Uh, different issues. Um, first of all, of course, mainly I'm going to be talking about social work. And it's important to say that um, in discussing social work, um, there are many other areas of uh, concern <coughs> around human relationships and COVID-19, which are not to do with social work, but we're focusing on the, the social work issues. 
The second uh, area of, uh, that we're looking at is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic that at the moment we're living through. Um, I'm sitting here in my house, uh, forbidden to go out unless to do important human things. Um, and the consequence of the government's, uh, all government controls to uh, control infection has been an effect on human relationships. So the second issue that we need to look at is uh, the human relationships aspects of what uh, COVID-19 has uh, created. And um, of course, uh, social work um, operates on human relationships, on family relationships, on community relationships. And so um, social work is always engaged in social events like uh, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, on human life and human relationships. So this is the, the, the intersecting three issues that we're looking at. And I'm going to start by um, looking at some of the human relationship impacts of COVID-19 before then going on to how social work uh, interacts with those. Well, the first thing to say about uh, COVID-19 is that it is uh, a virus, a coronavirus, hence COVID, and the D is disease. So it's a disease that comes from a coronavirus, um, which was first identified in, 19, in 2019. And as with uh, all illness, um, it uh, creates morbidity. Morbidity is the technical term for um, uh, illnesses and physical conditions which arise from uh, various uh, impacts on human bodies. So, um, and there are two kinds of morbidity that COVID-19 creates. There's an immediate acute illness for a proportion of the population. Uh, and that illness affects a small proportion of the total population and a very small proportion of younger people, but a quite a high proportion of uh, people as they age, so that people in their 70s and 80s are much more likely to catch uh, COVID-19, uh, the COVID-19 illness, and it's much more likely to have a serious effect on them. And it's much more likely to lead to the second issue, which I'm going to look at, which is death. So there is that immediate uh, illness. Um, but uh, we need to be aware that there is also something which uh, in my country is called long COVID, and that is long term consequences of the illness. And those are physical. Some of the symptoms seem to continue for many weeks and months and possibly it will be years, we, it's hard to know. And um, the effect on different people in the population varies. In fact, it seems that the long COVID illness may affect younger people more, and it may affect people who were not seriously affected by an acute uh, illness. So we have uh, types of illness here which are affecting people's lives. Now, the second thing about uh, uh, the COVID illness is that it's a, a, what the doctors would call a novel co coronavirus. It's a new coronavirus, um, which has transferred from the animal kingdom. And so we don't know how it works. And a year ago, when it was beginning to have its impact across the world, uh, we didn't know how to treat it and we didn't know how to respond. And so one of the human relationship impacts of that illness is uh, the fear that people experienced, anxiety, um, a consciousness of a risk, uncertainty, um, a, a tipping up of all our human activities in some way. And that then has 
consequences in relationships and social work, particularly concerned with family and intimate relationships. Um, and so uh, where social work might potentially see its area of helping is in those family and intimate relationships. But also social work um, has a role in trying to uh, establish and improve community and institutional uh, relationships. And so all of these have been tipped up by um, the, uh, the illnesses deriving from COVID-19. And it is the health consequences and the illnesses which need to be dealt with, and that's primarily a health issue. But then there are family and community and organizational consequences. COVID-19 causes death, early death, um, in a proportion of the population. Not everyone, and that's an aspect of the fear and the relationship consequences, uh, but there are people who die because of this illness before their time. And that means there is family and community disruption. People's relationships are disrupted by the end of someone's life. And uh, that is uh, important not only for the person who dies, uh, uh, but for the family and community around them. I always say that uh, we all die and we all will die. And um, that means being removed from our current pattern of relationships. Um, but we also, uh, that dying is not something which is wholly individual. It is always a social matter because we usually die um, with our family and our community around us. And so in the process of dying, we have to think about our family and community relationships and the way in which they will subsequently be disrupted. And then there are consequences for the people in those relationships, their grief and their bereavement. Whatever they believe about what may happen to them after death, their, their relationship after death, um, they will have to readjust their relationships. And then finally, because of the way in which a novel illness like this tips up relationships and community and institutional uh, arrangements, there are policy, political and social impacts uh, and uh, uh, a loss of confidence. And among the things that are often, uh, that have been kind of concern in relation to COVID-19 is whether we were adequately prepared for the possibility of such a pandemic, whether we were prepared to provide the treatment and the care that was needed, how competently we organized ourselves, and whether we were able to manage the public health, all the interactions which will prevent uh, the transmission of the disease and which will prevent um, uh, uh, wider effects of the disease. And another impact which has been crucial is an impact on our care services, which is where I want to end up towards the end of what I want to say. One of the issues which uh, any country um, and political system faces with a major social disruption like this is an effect on the economy. Um, if we cannot work, if we cannot produce, if we cannot communicate, take part with, with each other, um, then our economy is disrupted, our wealth is disrupted, and our capacity to respond to impacts on our lives is disrupted. Uh, and so um, for a political party, for a political system, for a government, there is this very difficult balance between concern for the economy and concern for care. And we have to remember that um, in the health and social work fields, we are 
particularly concerned about care, but we're also concerned for the economic system that we have because the evidence of morbidity, this issue that we have here, the illness and for death, we have found that the poorest people are more likely to become ill and more likely to die. And that is because they have less resilience to the impacts of important responses to this. So that's just to introduce some of the issues around human relationships which COVID-19 raises for us, the pandemic raises for us. Now then to look at the third part of our um, issue, uh, issues and um, see what social work strategies might be achieved. Now I'm showing you this picture of a, a block game that children play um, because it reflects something about social work that social work is very strongly concerned with uh, connections between people um, with how different parts of our lives and different parts of our communities interlock interact and this picture illustrates that aspect of social work very well. Well, I would think, I think I would uh, uh, identify um, three social work strategies um, for responding to COVID. And I think looking at the response to COVID, um, we can begin to see um, what social work responses might be to other uh, disasters and issues in, uh, that have a, a, a drastic impact on our communities and our societies. And I would identify three possible strategies. And to say a little bit about strategies, um, we're often, when we work on social work, we're looking at detail, we're looking at community relationships and community resources and community resilience. And we're looking at interpersonal relationships. So we're looking at the detail. But in order to make progress with the detail, we have to have a view of where we're trying to end up, um, where we would like to um, make progress towards. And we need to find steps on the way. And it's not appropriate to do social work only by looking at the detail that is in front of us. We have also to lift our eyes and look at the um, direction that we want to go in and how we can step towards that direction. So I think there, uh, in, in this kind of situation, there are three uh, social work strategies that we might follow. The first is to respond to the uh, pandemic as a disaster situation. It's a, an impact which has uh, tipped us up and created a disaster for us. And in that way, it is like um, a major uh, traffic or uh, an air crash, um, a, rain, a rail crash. It's um, an avalanche, a uh, road slip, it's a uh, flood. Uh, these kinds of things um, require a particular approach. And we could treat COVID-19 as, as a disaster situation like that. Another social work strategy is to adapt the existing services and strategies, structures that we have for delivering social work. And um, it's interesting that some of the initial research into how governments and societies have responded to COVID has suggested that what they've done, first of all, is to use their existing social strategy and social structure. It was recently published just this month, a series of studies across Europe and in Asia and in uh, North America, which looked at the policy response to COVID. And the evidence is that what countries have done is to uh, use their existing direction of travel. Um, and this has meant that many countries have focused on um, 
an economic response, maintaining employment, trying to stop unemployment, and uh, dealing with the financial consequences of uh, the uh, pandemic. And of course, um, in doing that, to deal with the health, immediate health consequences. They have not been very good at dealing with the social consequences. Um, the social work um, approach is to look much more clearly at the social consequences and relationship consequences. And that's why I think it's important for social work also to look at its established professional principles and build a new response to something like COVID using their social work's own ideas about the social. So um, what I'm wanting to do today is to look at some of the, I'll look first of all at the social work responses to disaster, but um, I want mainly to look at relationship responses. Uh, and this is uh, building on established social work practice. So to look at the disaster strategy first, um, the social work response to disasters is, is quite well established and it fits in with the civil response. One of the things about social work being about connectedness and um, uh, fitting things together is that social work always tries to fit in with the major services which have to respond to a difficult situation. And so social work looks and says, what, what should be our response to uh, cooperate with the major services that are involved here? And if it's a, um, an aircraft crash, or if it's a, a tsunami, or if it's a flood, you look at the emergency services first and see how you can relate to them. So the social work approach to disasters has tended to be periodization. It periodizes the, the disaster and the phases with, that you go through. First of all, there is a period of impact. Um, you have to react to what's happened. You have to rescue people and you have to respond to the impact of the present disaster. And in the case of COVID, this has been about making sure that hospitals and health services can respond to the degree of illness and to help people to manage the consequences of the illness in their, in their lives. And as things go on, there is a period of recoil from the immediate response. And that means that you have to help people to feel secure in how they are dealing with the situation. And what you will get then is people's emotional uh, personal responses to the effect on them if someone has died in their family or if they have had to change their lives or if they've lost their job and you need to help them begin to plan and the third approach is a period of recovering from the disaster situation now i think we are well into a period of impact because uh, health services and the public services and the government organizations have worked out how they're going to deal with this and they're progressing along their uh, system. Uh, and many people have had to react to their per the person impacts on them. So we're certainly well, going well through the period of recoil, but we still have to work out how we deal with the period of recovery, re-establishing ourselves perhaps in a new way, reclaiming some of the things that we want to keep and replanning some of the directions that we were moving towards because we can no longer go there. So you think about insurance and compensation for people, re-establishing their living arrangements, thinking about their longer term psychological and physical responses, and that connects us with long COVID, the long-term physical consequences of the illness, reclaiming the family and community relationships which we might have lost, thinking about bereavement and loss. Every social change involves losses which people have to be able to deal with. And then we have to begin to think about how are we going to prevent this uh, impact in the future? Um, 
we recently in our country had a lot of flooding and I know this is a, uh, an issue for um, India sometimes. And when we had a, a, a couple of years when there was a, an increased degree of flooding, people began to say, well, perhaps we're not controlling flooding in the right way. We need to think again about how we're going to do this and change the, 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 the law and the arrangements for protecting people. We also made decisions about the fact that um, we weren't able to protect some of our land mass. And so some areas would have to be left to return to the sea or return to wildness. And sometimes we have to rethink our way of life. And we are beginning to see people thinking, do I want to live in the way that I have been living? Or do I want to change my direction? And in this period of recovery, social work can make a very strong uh, contribution. And the contribution that, oops, I'm, I need to click the wrong thing there, so I'm going to Uh, I've done something technically there. That's it. Yeah, good. Um, the, the adaptation responses that we might begin to think about and that we have certainly become affected by are the way in which social responsibilities have been disrupted. In our country, we have seen a massive increase in the amount of domestic and what's called intimate partner violence, violence in people's families. Um, because people have been forced to live in their own homes rather than to be able to go out. So there are, there are fewer releases. Social life has reduced. The arts and culture uh, has reduced in its impact. And so people's emotions cannot be contained in the same way. So we have needed to... Um, think about uh, safeguarding uh, people's safety, continuing to educate people about how to manage their situation and to provide care. We've had to adapt our roles because our hospitals are under pressure because of the health crisis. And so they're less able to provide, um, uh, less able to provide uh, community and social care. So we've had to provide care in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so the social work role has begun to change. And we have increased responsibilities to respond to the psychological difficulties of um, the illness, new social circumstances for people, more complexity, and increases in bereavement, grief, and loss. We have found, for example, in our local bereavement service here, that um, a lot of, a lot more people are coming forward having been affected by losses. And that's both losses according to, because of death, but also losses um, because of losses of relationships and grief about um, the change in circumstances that we have all faced. So um, here, uh, I've looked at um, the kinds of involvement that social work might have and has begun to have on the adaptations that need to take place. These are short-term adaptations to uh, the social effects of um, uh, on relationships with the pandemic, but they're also beginning to plan for longer-term relationships. So this is to move on now um, from the disaster uh, scenario to look at our established social work principles and the context in which we work in social work. Now, the first thing to say about established social work principles I always want to start with is that social work is a contextual profession. It always looks at the social context of the personal experience. And so, um, we are, as a profession, always going to be looking at the personal, interpersonal, and its social context. And in order to respond to that social context, 
increasingly our theory and our practice looks for strengths and it looks for strengths in the community and family around individuals and it does not see that community and family as a context it's not a background to what's happening to the individual it is part of what the individual faces so we look for increasing the capacity of social networks and relationships and the modern term for uh, focusing on this is the idea of social capital um, a person a family a community a society a culture the more it increases uh, its links its strengths uh, the more capital it has to uh, expend just like economic capital to deal with the social issues that it faces. Then another established social work principle that I think is important is there's a lot of talk about um, preventing uh, risky situations and making people safe. And yes, that's important, but I like to look at that as uh, uh, con con conceptualize that as concerned with security. And security is not just physical safety, uh, it includes emotional and relationship safety. And finally, what social work would try to achieve is um, empowering people to uh, be useful to other people. Human beings uh, are not just concerned with themselves, but with their relationships and their usefulness to others. We don't only want to achieve things for ourselves, we achieve things for others, that's important. Now to talk about uh, our professional responsibilities, I want briefly to mention our own self-care and support. You cannot, as a professional, help others and help others to support others unless you are um, prepared to uh, focus on caring for yourself as well. We need to timetable into our lives respite for ourselves and our team not just carry on. And this is particularly important in uh, disaster, high pressure situations. We need to cooperate with others, but one of the principles of social work is we expect no thanks from people. It is our job to help. It is our job to be involved with others. We don't expect them to thank us for our involvement. We must look for signs of post-traumatic stress syndrome to think about the trauma that affects us. We're constantly tired, we start to forget things, our reactions slow, we don't eat well, we overreact to things. These are signs that we're not coping with the stress well and we need to care for ourselves. And we need to support our colleagues and be supported by our colleagues. Four kinds of support we talk about, emotional support, being open to listening to others and accepting that people will make emotional reactions and that we will react emotionally. To share information, not to expect credit for knowing things and doing things, to share resources, not to expect thanks for it. To take on some of other people's work if we can. To be help people to appraise the situation they're dealing with and, and work on that. And we might need to try to create a good social climate in our teams and professional growth. So we need to think not only about the problem that we're facing, the, what we want to achieve and the services we're trying to provide, but we also need to think about making ourselves strong enough to be able to provide that service. Now then, I want to move on to looking at relational practice. And this is an updated formulation of uh, a very established social work approach 
which says that the way in which social workers do their work is to get into relationships with people. And this is relevant both to personal practice and to community and social development. In personal practice, what we do is create an alliance with individuals and families and communities to tackle, on, to tackle agreed problems that they have. We work on things that happen to them. And we also work on things about them and the people around them. And one of our roles is to keep calm and sort things out. And it's the same in community and social development. We find allies, connections, uh, uh, fitting people together to agree on problems, work on things that happen in that community. We're now talking about how uh, COVID-19 has affected individuals in personal practice and communities in development practice. And we think about things about that community and its people as we think about things about the individual and the people around them. We have to think about them and their uh, community as well. And it's the same approach, keep calm and sort things out. And the way in social work we've always talked about this is we've talked about the person and the environment. This photograph of a lady I uh, met the last time I was in West Bengal. And she illustrates for me uh, what is important about social work. She is a grandmother looking after her grandchild. Um, but it's about relationships for her. It's about what's personally important to her, uh, her person. But uh, around her is uh, uh, an, an environment the things that help her to exist in relationship to others and in, as part of a community and society. Our social work says you can't think about a person unless you also think about the environment surrounding them. Environment is not a background to that person. Environment is part of that person. And similarly, if you're working in a community, you can't work on the community unless you are concerned with and focused on the, um, uh, the people within it. And you have to carry both. You should not be working with persons unless you are uh, thinking about the social environment in which they live. You should not be working on a community and its development unless you are thinking about the people in it and their development in a personal sense. So relational practice says that you should be looking at three kinds of issues. First of all, you should be looking at dynamics, how interactions work in this community or it, with these people, the factors and the people, how they interact, how they affect each other, how they think about them, and how they act as a result of their thinking. Then you should be thinking about the sources of energy for these people and the sources of the issues and problems that they face. And you should be trying to analyze, to check, to classify what you're seeing. The range of the relevant factors and what works well in dealing with those factors. And uh, if you're looking at those uh, issues all the time, in social work practice, you also have to look at those issues in the community around those people, the environment, and you have to look at them for the people themselves. So then you intervene. And in relational practice, you use the relationships uh, the interventions that you have, uh, the alliances that you have created. And the first thing that you always do is that you create what a great theoretician, John Bowlby, uh, called a secure holding environment, a safe harbor. What your relationship does is, in, is create a safe place for people to work on their issues, 
This is a harbor in the evening in Spain. And then you use your relationship to contain complexity, to, to not make things so complicated that people can't deal with them. And the technical term for doing this is partialization. You divide problems up into manageable chunks. You model in how you are and how you behave towards people, effective relationships. You try to repair difficulties from past relationships. You try to head off adverse events. So you try to help people through the immediate crisis while people gain their strength again. And you reflect on what's happening, ask questions, suggest explanations, get people thinking uh, so that a thinking is a strength. And you improve people's coping with new situations. Uh, see it differently. Deal with a part of it. Look for options. Those are the kinds of things that you do in social work interventions. And then there are sometimes things that you avoid. You avoid a rush to certainty. Don't try and make everything clear and certain and precise and organized right away. You may be wondering about this picture. This is uh, a race which happens every year in a small island in, in the United Kingdom. And these people are racing, not in boats, but in tin baths, the kind of baths that you bath your children in, in front of the fire. Um, it's a, uh, and uh, I use this picture to illustrate rushing. You must not race into situations. You must also listen, listen to the alternative narratives that people put forward, the in, in alternative ways of thinking that there are in the situation you're dealing with. You must explore the ambiguities, the uncertainties, things that you can't be sure of and that people are not sure of. And in exploring them, you're opening them up to possibilities. And so therefore, that enables you to look for opportunities. So um, that's an important set of uh, styles, how we uh, intervene as a social worker. And a fourth set of interventions, you try to give people experience of working cooperatively because this will help people gain experience of cooperating in relationships. You try to give people experience of working with organizations, uh, of making claims, of making applications, dealing with things in a personal sense and helping organizations to help you. You help people to think about their feelings and relationships because it helps them to feel in control. You help people to work through issues, looking at each detail in turn, but you try to stop them from getting stuck on one issue. And you look for positives, strengths and solutions. What went well there? What can you do that works well? And can you do more of that? How can you improve the next time you do it? And when they're successful, you say, wow, fantastic. It's great that you can do that. Um, that's progress. Can you do that again? So what I've looked at here is a list of interventions that social work says, this is helpful in difficult situations and you can use relationships using these interventions to help people through difficult situations like the pandemic and the family response to it and bereavement and loss and help them take steps forward towards their future. So I'm now going to return briefly to COVID-19 and relationships. Well, what went wrong in COVID-19? And I'm going to concentrate for just this, this little bit on the area where I still work mostly, and that is on uh, older people, people in their later stages of their life. What went wrong with them, the COVID? Well, across the world, we did very badly uh, at dealing with care homes. 
We know that when we put older people together in a day centre or a care home or a club or encouraging them to meet up together, that's good for their interpersonal relationships and it helps them usually. But uh, what we have forgotten is that older people um, are more liable to respiratory infections. And so when you have a respiratory coronavirus, by putting uh, vulnerable older people together, you're going to increase the risk that they will be infected. And partly through ignorance about how this virus worked in its early stages, we didn't protect people, older people in care homes. And so across the world, large numbers of older people have died unnecessarily in care homes because we didn't think about how to protect them. When we realized this, we then tried to protect them by isolating them. If you were at risk, if you were liable to become ill, um, then you were isolated from the risk of infection. But what we didn't think about was that in doing that, uh, older people would lose their intimate relationships. Members of their family couldn't see them, not so uh, able to use computers to maintain interpersonal connections. And we didn't realize that care staff working in the community would also bring the risk that's in the community of infection into contact with vulnerability. So what does this tell us about um, the system that we have? Well, it seems to me that what we failed to do was to do the social work thing of thinking about relationships. And social work as a profession didn't have enough influence and power to remind people that relationships and interactions and humanity are important. There was a rush to deal with the health problems and the doctors and the infection and uh, what governments could do, which was exert uh, physical control, was dealt with. But we didn't have enough uh, influence as social work to uh, concern the humanity and the relationships that we should deal with. And the way in which I illustrate that is by thinking about care as a form of caring. You cannot care for people, you cannot help them, unless the policy and the service environment enables caring to take place. And as I said uh, earlier on, the recent research seems to show that in relation to COVID, we concentrated on people's uh, economic protection, work protection, employment, um, the things that governments could control, and the health side without thinking about the human aspect of caring. Then we need to think about the qualities of the caregiver that predispose them towards caring. Not everyone is a good caregiver. We need to find those good caregivers and put them in the place which enables them to provide care. Caring acts have particular behavioral qualities that people recognize as caring. And as you care for people, your caring relationship unfolds. So you begin to gain those behavioral qualities. As social workers, that is what our education does for us. That is what um, your education at your university helps you to do, to begin to develop the behavioral qualities that you already have towards being able to care in difficult situations. And then that means that your care can help transform people's situations. It can transform communities and it can transform individual relationships. So what I'm arguing here is that we have to focus in dealing with disastrous situations, emergencies, difficult situations like COVID on caring in relationships. And social work has that background. 
its established principles are about caring in relationships. And this is relevant to old situations, it's always relevant, but it's also relevant to new situations. And in the case of COVID-19, social work has not had the power to demonstrate that. It's adaptable to community and social development and to interpersonal social work. And because all social work uses relationship, uh, it can achieve objectives which are different from the kinds of uh, relationships which can be offered by other professions. In particular, that person and environment connection. The fact that we never think about a person without thinking about their environment. Now, I've gone very quickly through some current issues around COVID and some social work principles and practice. So I just want to draw your attention to which your, uh, our, our colleague mentioned to you, some of the recent books which I've been writing about this area. And if you want to follow up some of the things I've been saying about social work, the how to use theory, social work theory and practice is a very practical guide um, to how you use things like relationship. And in talking about relational practice today, I've drawn on that book to, to show you how you can identify very clear interventions which social workers can use. And if you want to know more about social work's practices in, in, and it's their theoretical background, my bigger and I'm afraid more expensive book uh, on modern social work theory has just been published in the last month or two. Um, again, it's in its fifth edition and is a very detailed account um, and theoretical analysis of social work theory. I want to thank you for listen, listening to me. I'm hoping to uh, be able to spend some more time with you now to be able to uh, hear from you and to hear some of your debate about social work, COVID and human relationships. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. And here's how to contact me. Um, thank you so much, sir, for this interaction. It was indeed a privilege for all of us to listen to you. And uh, right now, I would also invite people uh, in the house if they have any questions or they want to discuss something with you. Um, is there anything that they want to know uh, so that we can have a meaningful uh, discussion for about some time? And so regarding your book, uh, the, the recent one, uh, our central library has uh, applied to Procreo for one. So we would be soon having that uh, with us. Uh, so that social work students and teachers can benefit from it. Um, so I invite all the participants, if there's any question, you can uh, put it on the chat box and we can share it with sir. We can wait two, three minutes to take up the questions. Uh, can, can we ask, uh, because, you know, at times... Sure, sure. Sure, okay, sure. So I'm here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm uh, thank you, sir, for, you know, like COVID has uh, made us rethink the spaces we, uh, we took for granted. So I'm teaching um, uh, in the Department of Chinese uh, language here. And, you know, I have, I have older parents and I have younger kids at home. So uh, I have seen a very different kind of pressure that has, you know, I'm not a trained caregiver, but uh, definitely the onus comes on me uh, as a caregiver. And I often, uh, you know, like um, uh, end up blaming myself for not knowing many things, right? Uh, however, considering the situation in India, family naturally, uh, becomes, uh, you know, is the first caregiver uh, place, caregiver, another thing. Now my question is, uh, after this corona, as we are trying to come out of this situation, I face another challenge of reassure, reassuring my family that, you know, we can be brave enough and we can be like with little care, we can move ahead and uh, ahead with our normal life. 
do you think there is a role of professionals, social workers in guiding people like us into coming back to a, 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 a normal is a coming out to this like you know so i would like your intervention yes. thank you sir well, i think one of the, the immense disruptive effects of uh, covid has been on the educational process. Uh, the schools, uh, I don't know about India, but in uh, the UK, the schools have been closed substantially for long periods of time. And very few children have had the opportunity to continue in education. And uh, it's interesting when you talk to children about that, um, the research seems to show this, that um, children are missing out on education because they don't have the continuity of involvement in learning. And um, uh, great efforts have been made uh, to uh, provide education at home um, and you know, to provide things, resources so that children can have further continuing education. Um, but actually, one of the things that uh, COVID has done for education in our area, in our country, has, is to demonstrate how important teachers are. Um, because people are inclined to say, well, teachers, uh, you know, anyone can teach children things really. And parents have found that in trying to continue with their children's education, actually teaching is very, very important. And it's a very difficult and professional task. So one of the things is the interrupt in, in education. And one of the economic concerns, the policy concerns, has been that uh, the interruption in education will set these children back forever, that they will earn less in their life uh, because they are not able to make progress in their education. So that's an important consequence. And parents have been very distressed about the interruption for their children. But you're right to say that is also disrupted caregiving in a very important way. Children who are particularly involved, uh, vulnerable and subject to domestic violence, uh, violence in the home, violence in their community, uh, losses of that kind, um, they, don't, they haven't had such protection as they normally have from their families and from their, the society, the community around them. And so, uh, they are feeling much less secure and the interruption of education has often interrupted their non-home relationships. Uh, we all have, an, as you go through childhood, your, your, your home becomes balanced with your peer relationships and the COVID, uh, the effect of the COVID pandemic has um, made both of those difficult. It's more difficult to provide the caring advice for parents adequately. It's more difficult to provide the education and it's more difficult for young people to maintain, sustain their relationships in their community. And children need their relationships in the community just as much as parents. So I think it's uh, important for everyone to think about how we can help children make uh, progress with this and it's important to support and help parents to think about how they can help their children make up for the uh, damaging effects of uh, the pandemic on our societies. So I think you're absolutely right it's, it's really important for everyone to have a go and see how they, how they can help with children. Any more questions from participants? Thank you, sir. Any more questions from the participants? Okay, uh, uh, I, sir. I have, I have one question. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, Shubhasri, my request is that, you know, when they ask questions, they keep on, you know, talking more about themselves or more about other things, less about the questions. So let them ask them sharp questions so that many of the participants can take part in this uh, session. Okay, sir. Um, um, hello, can I ask? Um, I, okay. Um, 
just a moment yeah. just a moment uh, somebody was asking a question a bit while ago uh, who is this uh, i am uh, uh, i am because maji i have one yeah. question sir yes. uh, uh, do you think that the micro insurance policy of the government may empower the people of any state or of the country do you think that micro insurance can uh, empower the people for risk management and they can cope with the risk situation because pandemic is a co variant risk that risk events that affect many people many households simultaneously and larger geographical or social spread so do you think that micro insurance can play important role for the people who living below poverty line or they have low socio economic background uh, that question okay Thank so you. back to you i think all the other participants can put their questions in the chat box and i can read it out to him it would be easier uh say so your response on this question please Uh, if, if you like, social inequality is leading to uh, uh, loss. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly think it is the case. Your audio is not clear. This is always the case with social yeah. development. Um, that uh, families are deprived of the speaker. I'm not listening. So the, so the audio, so the audio is a bit uh, not clear. If you could come close to the microphone, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's certainly the case that deprived communities, communities with without resources, and people in poverty, experience um, greater difficulties in dealing with emergencies and with any kind of social pressure and stress, and. um the question always arises what is the balance of dealing with providing better resources and trying to reduce poverty of course that is important and how how you deal with the emotional and relationship consequences of the inability to deal with the issues because you are uh unequal i should think i should also say that inequality in society itself damages the mere fact that you are aware that you're unequal and i'm fairly treated is is part of your inability to respond to it okay uh, so we have one question on the chat box uh, that's from elora badixil she's written covid-19 came like an impending doom how do we deal with perceived stress of the professionals who were exposed in the field of caring of the persons with covid-19 well i've tried to say in in the talk and if you look at the um presentation uh, there's a slide on this um that is really important that first of all as an individual professional you take responsibility for um your own self care and for the self care and support of the people around you but of course that requires also the agency that you work for or the community that you work in to also consider the stress on you and help to support you uh, i think it has been very difficult for people dealing for example with safeguarding children and safeguarding women in our country because of the increased level of violence it's very hard to carry out investigations it's very hard to feel that you are making people safe um when you when self isolation is an isolation is important uh, infection control strategy so it has been i think i think colleagues have found it immensely stressful not to be able to do their jobs using their skills as well as they hope to be able to do um it's important that their agencies recognize that as well as their colleagues and um others supporting them in recognizing that once relationship as a team as people who work together 
is an important part of the element of keeping going in a uh, disaster situation. But we must also recognize that there will be long-term impacts on our services. And we also uh, need to look further at the future. We can feel better about dealing with the present stresses if we know that our services are thinking about how we can uh, prevent difficulties like this again, how we can respond better. And the research which is going on to look at what went wrong in responding to COVID um, will help us, I hope, think about how we should better provide our services in the future. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have one more question on the chat box uh, from Dr. Shukumar Pal. He says, uh, can you put more light on disaster risk reduction, social work practice and COVID-19? So how do you see it as? Well, I think it's important to um, make space in your society and make space in your agency if you're employed by one or make space in your community if you're working in a community. Make space in your community for thinking about the risks that you're um, facing. Um, one of the useful things that uh, modern organizational management insists upon is that you every year uh, produce a risk register that you write down the risks that you think might happen to your community. And if you know that your community is liable to flooding or to you're, you're near an airport, so you might suffer a, 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 a crash, um, these are things to think about so that you can think about them in advance. So thinking about the risks that your community faces are important. And one of the failings of my country was to think about the risk of a pandemic. We knew that there was a risk of pandemic. Um, there have been pandemics throughout uh, history uh, and they're regular and you can, uh, the statisticians were saying uh, before COVID-19 happened, uh, you know, we're, we're late for the next really big global pandemic. And of course, our societies nowadays are so interlinked that uh, risks of this kind are liable to affect the whole globe, not just a proportion of it. Um, so it's really important to think about potential risks and to work on preparing for it. Now, my country fails to do that. And our government um, failed to think about working hard with the possibility, dealing with the possibility of a novel coronavirus. It thought about other problems, but not this one. And one of the things that it's important for social work to say is that um, social consequences of what you do is an important part, what happens to societies and communities are an important factor to think about when you're planning for the future. There has been a tendency in the case of COVID to think about health and employment and security and social security of course those are important but in the long term it's people's relationships and people's communities that are important and actually covid has shown us this and it's perhaps shown us this to people who otherwise wouldn't have thought about relationships and communities in the way that we in social work do i hope that the experience of the pandemic will lead to this concern about relationship and um, uh, social relations uh, to be much more seriously addressed in future disaster planning. Thank you so much, sir. I think uh, we had I'm our not, uh, not last one question. Uh, uh, who is this? I can't recognize. Uh, uh, my name is Padmini Balram. I'm sorry I'm not able to get into the chat box. That's why I'm asking. Sure, Can I sure, ask you? sure, sure, ma'am. Uh, and Paul, I wanted to, it was very nice hearing your lecture. I wanted to, what you pointed out was like you uh, 
like one mistake that has been done in covid 19 situation was that with the socially uh, as the uh, patients were isolated and uh, uh, the family uh, support system was not there so one lost lot of people lo lost lot of life because of that now that the second wave is coming don't you, what do you think the universities do should do I mean, should it be like uh, when the uh, say suppose if there is a lockdown and the universities are closed, should every faculty members and their students be kept in the university uh, in their in the same station? They have to be there, or they should be allowed to go to their houses and have a social uh, support system with them. What do you think about it? So, so Sushree. So yeah, uh, can I finish this question and then address your question, Devotus, sir? Can I finish this question and once we move on to your question then? Um, uh, so the earlier question was, uh, uh, so the earlier question was that uh, what should the universities do uh, because of the second wave of COVID-19? Should it be sh uh, shut or uh, should the method continue the way it is online? Uh, that was her question. No, that is not only that. Uh, that is when it it comes to online education. Should yeah. one uh, one has to be all logged in to the same station, or can the faculty members and students be allowed to go uh, to their houses to get the social securities? Okay. And okay. Them working. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, uh, sir, your response, please. Well, this is this has been really difficult for universities in in uh, England because um, for infection control reasons universities have been closed or their functioning has been changed. Um, there have been efforts to sustain interpersonal teaching um, in things like social work and medicine, where these uh, this is necessary to the education. I think, though, to comment on something you said towards the end of what you were saying, um, you cannot pursue education unless you feel secure. I'm sure as uh, somebody who's working in a university, many of my colleagues will know that unless students feel safe, ready to um, work on their educational goals, oh, uh, it, it's, it's impossible to uh, focus on the, the education that you want to achieve. So I think there always has to be a balance. Um, and I think there are some forms of education which cannot be um, pursued online and in technical ways. Um, however, I think um, as to comment on another th thing which is in the uh, chat, uh, it, it is the case that some younger people uh, have grown up with, I, I look at my grandchildren and the way in which they are comfortable with all sorts of um, uh, online and technical um, uh, ways of acting, which I'm less comfortable with. And so I think that over time, there will be an increased capacity to do the human aspects of um, education in um, uh, an online way or using technology. And I certainly think that over the past 50 or 60 years, we have seen increasing waves of technical ways of improving um, the quality and focus of our educational offer. So I, th I think we should never deny the possibility that we can teach better and use technology to teach better. But I, I think teaching and learning are human things which require personal and emotional security and readiness. And um, if you're gonna benefit from education, if you're gonna be able to achieve education through teaching, you also have to have a uh, human contact. And I can wave my arms around and and uh, appear more human, um, but in some aspects, it's not possible to have that human contact in uh, using technological means or, or online. You can do some of it, you can 
not do others. But you can also gain from uh, new educational technologies to improve what you're doing. And uh, I think it's really important as a, a teacher and a learner to want to try new things to make them work for you in your learning. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have another question on the chat box uh, from Arpita Chatterjee. Uh, she says, at the time of social distancing, how can media be helpful for dynamic practices of social work? Well, I, I think it's certainly possible to use uh, online and other ways of education uh, and, and to use them in social work as well. You can communicate with people using the technology that we're using now. And in many aspects, that is uh, that is possible and helpful. You can also devise ways in which you can use techniques, questionnaires, projective work, story stems is, a, is used a, a lot in some work with children, for example, and with adults, narrative techniques, all sorts of techniques which you can use in um, socially distanced ways. Um, and I think it's important to learn from the experience we're having now to be able to use those kinds of techniques and be prepared to use them. But I think uh, there are one or two cautions I have. Firstly, I think it, it, in, it, in terms of understanding people's social relationships and human interactions in families and communities and helping with that, um, to be able to see the situation around people and how they live and their, um, how they react to things in real life and not at, uh, on a screen, um, it's important to, to have that interpersonal human contact and contact. One of the things about social work is that it's a it's a home visiting type of profession um, that people are actually in the community. They are part of the community and they're in people's homes. So it's, it's one of the important things about social work that it really tries to connect with people's real lives. So uh, that's one thing. The second thing is, of course, technology has to be paid for. It's all very well um, for, for us in our universities and with the technical resources that, that our colleagues have managed to organize for us. Uh, and we and my expensive computer here, which I've paid for um, uh, because I can afford it. But many people who have the most need for the most personal help do not have access to the, the best uh technological resources that would help them and so uh, we can't assume that we can make contact with them many of these school children for example who have most lost most in education have lost it because they can't access the internet and the learning resources that their schools can offer them so um we also have to remember that uh technology is expensive and uh, whereas we may brush it off, our organizations may brush it off, it's a really big factor in many people's lives. Uh, and food and um, living security is more important than being able to use technology. So um, it's very difficult for many families to afford to have technical help in the way that we uh, can use it in a university or in a society with a lot of good resources. So you remember that we as social workers try to help the poorest communities, the most oppressed communities, the communities with the most difficulties, and they will have the most difficulty in using the technical resources that we might try to use to contact them. So I don't think I don't think you can ever forget the importance of the human contact and the actual real social contact in people's uh, lives, neither can you uh, afford to uh, ignore the reality that um, access to resources is unequal and the people who struggle most that we would like to help also struggle most have access to the resources for us to help them. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, can I have the question from Professor Debotosh Sinha, please? Professor Sinha, are you online? It needs perhaps to uh, unmute. Okay. Um, One of the difficult things about this program is you have to remember to un unmute. <laughs> That's it. Good. See, I'm muted. Uh, do you... Oh, yeah. Go to the next person. Okay. Is anybody? Uh, any more questions are uh, there? Uh, I think so. I think we will. Uh, I think Professor Sinha is available. Uh, can we have the question from him? Am I audible? Yes, yes. yes, yes. Question to bolo, uh, I have a one question to say. How, how far the core methods of social work practice will be applicable in this pandemic situation? I think you can use, I think you can use all methods of social work and adapt them to pandemic situation and and I think social work methods have shown to be um, uh, adaptable to many kinds of uh, situations but I think they constantly develop in response to the uh, the experiences that we have so I have no doubt that the experience of um, the uh, pandemic will lead us to learn new ways of using our approaches um, in ways which will benefit future difficulties that our societies face. So I think we are always learning from the difficulties we have in uh, implementing our practice and we learn from the experiences of implementing our practice and the ways in which people tell us um, that was useful, that wasn't useful, that helped me. We made progress with that and that's uh it's important to realize also that um, this is an, uh, an aspect of um uh, research that um different situations make different um models of practice useful so one of the reasons for holding in your mind a range of models of practice is so that you can respond to the needs of the situation with an appropriate model of practice. You can't hold everything in your mind, but you can check out and with, with the basic skills of social work, you can begin to use and uh, increase the validity of um, models of practice in new situations. And I think COVID-19 actually is a, a wonderful example of that. Thank you so much, sir. Um, it was wonderful um, having you with the in, in the interaction interaction session uh, and uh, you know sharing your opinions with all our uh, um, audiences here. And uh, now I invite our honourable vice chancellor to share his remarks, and we would then conclude our session, sir. Well, uh, Professor Payne, uh, thank you very much for your very very in a lucid discussion. Uh, no, I have a question. Uh, let me begin with the question and then I'll you know, make the formal remarks to just express my gratitude to you. You know, after having heard you, I get the impression that social work uh, as a discipline is a creative blending of ideas from various disciplines, history, politics, sociology, economics, anthropology, you know, many, many disciplines add to the social work. So do you think, you know, keeping that in mind, keeping that hypothesis in mind, uh, can social work be treated as an independent discipline in the sense that it had a very specific kind of methodology, very specific kind of, you know, uh, knowledge system which will help humanity to go ahead. That's one question. 
And the second question, why uh, has this question come to my mind? You know, when you are um, uh, when you are addressing us, I am reminded of a famous book by John D. Ruskin, an English you know uh, academicians who wrote a book called Unto This Last. And that particular book is very important and also very fascinating simply because uh, Gandhiji, Mahatma Gandhi was inspired by that book. And that book is essentially an attempt to uh, contribute to the most marginalized uh, sections of society. I mean, that's again, a kind of social work, which I gather from your discussion. So uh, uh, I mean, do you think Gandhi's ideas uh, can be of great help to understand the complexities of social work that you deal with as a professor of social work? Well, to, to, to take both of those questions together, uh, I see social work as part of the social sciences and humanities, and uh, potentially um, it draws upon uh, and can, because we're human beings, we can use the whole of human knowledge. I'm very uh, interested, very interested to um, explore the possibilities of using ideas from all sorts of uh, humanities and social sciences. Um, and these can inform the ways in which we think because human beings think in all these ways and the arts and our cult different cultures and our spiritualities um, express these in different ways and you can learn from all of them to do social work. I would argue that social work has an established and clear set of techniques and approaches, which is part of a territory in the health, social and education worlds, and in the area of social development, which is unique and special, but interconnected with related sciences and uh, artistic endeavors. For some time, I was responsible for yeah. arts service, and I found the artists that we worked with incredibly important. Um, and one learns from all of this, uh, and it helps with the understanding of humanity that we should have in order to do social work. But each social work agency and each social worker has particular responsibilities and techniques to apply. Um, and I think I would argue that um, I've never, never read Ruskin very much. I think uh, it's not something that's come to me, but and he was an unpopular academic for, for a while. Um, but I think one of the things I would say is that every time you can explore uh, someone's new ideas, you can add uh, color and uh, openness to the way in which you think about humanity. And I think it's therefore important to take every opportunity to, I've, I'll go and look at some Ruskin, uh, because I think uh, that, that, that will be something I've not, not done. And it's important to pick up ideas where you can. I do look and uh, read Tagore sometimes, because I find that that is a way of thinking about the world in, uh, from a culture and an environment, which is not my culture and environment. And I think it's Im important to challenge your set ideas. Um, and uh, I think one, that's one of the things that social work seeks to do. We're into, we need to unmute again. You know, I, I fully agree, agree with you that, you know, when we talk of uh, social sciences, we, we normally draw on each other. You know, I'm a student of politics, but when I do, you know, uh, uh, work on themes in political science, I draw upon history, economics, anthropology, you know, to understand my theme better. So that way, I think the approach which I adopt is interdisciplinary. That, that's something which is uh, very critical to us nowadays. We are, we are not very in a Catholic, 
in terms of our you know boundary of the domain on the contrary we become very you know open uh, minded uh, scholars who are open to ideas it doesn't matter the the direction it may come from the left it may come from the right it may come from the center so i mean i fully agree with your uh, perception and about uh, gandhi and tagore i think you know before i came to this part of the world um, i was away i was in delhi and i thought that uh, gandhi was perhaps the most brilliant you know kind of uh, 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 thinker in so far as humanity is concerned but after having read tagore uh, i find that tagore was far ahead of gandhi in many respects but unfortunately tagore didn't write much in english he wrote mostly in bangla in his mother tongue so that's yeah. why he didn't get adequate publicity while gandhi wrote you know mostly in english less in his mother tongue in vernacular gujarati so i think you know i mean the more i read about tagore the more you know i am convinced that it is tagore who was really ahead of so many of his colleagues of that particular generation so i'm really quite excited you know if you focus on tagore's ideas and his contribution to social work as a discipline that will be a great thing you know that will be kind of exploration of a new area of research you know uh, for people who are interested to know what they go talked about you know social work or contribution to humanity i think you know the debate can uh, uh, go on but for the pain you know i must you know express my gratitude to you uh, from the core of my heart that um, you spent so much time with us and i am sure those who listen to you uh, they are terribly benefited by your intervention by your perception of social work besides of course my colleagues from the department of social work who are directly you know connected with your works because when i when shubhashree mentioned your name i just checked in the google and as i said you know I, it would not be an exaggeration to characterize you as the father of social work uh, so i think we are really fortunate to have one of the topmost thinkers in the discipline of social work and you know uh, we express our gratitude on my behalf on behalf of my colleagues in our university bishop bharati uh, which was founded by tagore as you know in 1922 we are having a birth century of our university um, that you spent you spent your time and you really enlightened us on an area of uh, research where we 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 got a kind of you know very wider perception of how a particular discipline in the family of social sciences needs to be understood i mean with these words i i thank you again and as i said um, after having given lecture in this series we accept you as a member of our family so a member of families kind of you know presence uh, we don't record uh, on virtual mode so the member of the family has to come to bishwabharti uh, physically so uh, i think my request to you whenever you get time i mean i would love to have you as a kind of uh, visiting professor for a while so that our, our students will also get benefited by your knowledge by your direction so it's a kind of you know open uh, invitation to you professor pain just let us know what is convenient uh, for you to come to vishwabharati and spend some time with us with this again i thank you have a great day and you know uh, be safe uh, maintain physical distance but at the same time at the same time you know do not you know separate yourself from the humanity as a whole because those who are affected by corona virus they also need support so that way we may need physical distance but not social distance i mean the point which the world bank keeps making i am questioning that that you know in the context of corona what we require is physical distance not social distance so i think given your uh, faith or belief in humanity i also endorse that Uh, we in, in the university whenever i get a chance to talk to my colleagues i always you know, insist that please to avoid corona maintain physical distance but never ever nurture social distance that will be harmful to humanity thank you very much professor pain have a great great day thanks a lot so much aaj kuch bolta hai No, no thank you so much sir uh, thank you professor pain uh, i also thank our honorable vice chancellor and i also thank uh, the vishwabharati library network uh, and our librarian in charge 
Dr. Saha for uh, this wonderful organizing this wonderful lecture, and we will be connected to uh, Professor Payne as you said, sir, because he is now a part of our family. So I thank him once again, and I wish everybody a very good evening. Thank you. Let's thank you up. very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Now we may now exit. Let us, yeah, yeah. Now let us leave the meeting, sir. Yes, sir. So we can now exit from and the meeting. You know, Professor Payne, just a kind of you know for request. You know, uh, normally we upload it in our website and we put it in the YouTube. I'm sure you have no objection, right? So that if, if okay, then thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have sent you mail. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Privileged to be with you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.